In September 1938, I was passing through Saint Sebastian on my way back to France. Someone chosen by God to be a patron of musicians, but who still had to decide to become one, brought Regino Sainz de la Martha and myself together for lunch. We ate well, the wine wasn't bad either, and the moment was ideal for fantasies and daring ideas. This was also a time full of illusions in which we Spaniards believed that anything was feasible. But suddenly, Regino, in a voluble and determined way of his, said, My friend, you must come back with a concerto for guitar and orchestra. And to soften me up, he added in pathetic tones, It's been my lifelong dream. And to ingratiate himself further with me, he went on, You are the one destined to do this, like a chosen one. I immediately drank down two glasses of the best Rioja, and exclaimed with the greatest conviction in the world, My friend, it's done. I remember the scene very well, because that evening remained a happy memory throughout my life, and a moment of calm in those times which were so turbulent for Spain and so threatening for Europe. I remember, too, I don't know why, everything to do with the Concierto de Aranjuez remains in my memory, that one morning, two months later, standing in my little studio in the Rue Saint-Jacques in Paris, in the heart of the Latin Quarter, thinking vaguely about the concerto, since I'd become attached to the idea in spite of considering it difficult, I heard within me the entire theme of the Adagio, suddenly without a pause, almost as you're about to hear it. And suddenly, with hardly a transition, the theme of the third movement, exactly as it appears in the work. I quickly realised that the work was done. Our intuition doesn't deceive us in this. I sketched the outlines suggested by the respective themes and wrote the guitar part, together with a first very rudimentary and uncertain sketch of the orchestral part. Today, when I hear the orchestration of this work, I can't understand why I had so many doubts and was so dilatory in writing out the different levels of the accompaniment. This contrasted even more with the ease with which I composed the work, and above all, with the speed of its conception. If something akin to inspiration, that irresistible and supernatural force, brought me to the adagio and the final allegro, I came to the first movement through reflection, calculation, and willpower. It was the last movement of the three to be composed, and so I finished the work where I should have begun it. And for this reason I didn't have a clear picture of the whole, except when I'd written the first movement. The work was finished in a few months, and the orchestration, a tapestry which, woven around the most elusive of instruments, had itself to form a part of it and enclose it and be within it was to all intents and purposes complete. It was the spring of 1939.